for how you've treated us. It's been great. The, the hotel has been wonderful, and the fellowship has been wonderful. The food has been wonderful, and Baptists like to eat. I, I read about this teenage boy. He said this. His teacher asked his favorite an, what his favorite animal was in class one day, and he put his hand up. The teacher said, what's your favorite animal? He said, fried chicken. And she said it wasn't very funny, but it must have been funny. Everybody in the class laughed. And his parents had told him to always be truthful and honest, and he was. Fried chicken was his favorite animal. He told his dad that night, and his dad said his teacher was probably a member of PETA. And he said, they love animals very much. I do too, especially chicken and pork and beef and fish. And Well, the next day he went back there and and the teacher asked the next day what his favorite live animal was. And he raised his hand and he, she said, what is it? And he said, chicken. And she asked him why. And he said, because of all the things you can do with chicken. And everybody laughed again in the classroom. And he was sent a second time to the principal's office. And the principal laughed too, but said, don't ever say that again. Well, the third day, the teacher, teacher asked... Uh, What's, your, uh, what's, the, what's the most famous person that you admire the most? And he raised his hand and he said, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> you know what? It's been good. It's really bad. The fellowship's been good. The food's been good. And the shooting was good. And it's just been a blessing. I have asked the Lord to direct me what message to preach tonight. And I'm sure glad he's allowing me to preach this. Now that you found that Matthew chapter 13 if you would uh, please stand, I'd like us to read verse 34 and 35, and then verse 44. So Matthew 13, verse 34, verse 35, and then verse 44. Let's read together, reading out loud, beginning in verse 34. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for speaking to hearts. And Lord, maybe there is someone yet that you are dealing with their heart about something in particular, and they have not yet thrown up their hands and surrender to God. And as I've said, and as others have said to me, we could never be happier than by surrendering to the will of God. And so, Lord, I pray that whoever that might be, that they tonight say, God, whatever it is, I'll do what you want. The Lord, direct our thoughts, direct our words. Would you help this verse to come alive, that we would never look at it again without seeing all the wealth that's in this text. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, uh, the... Tonight, uh, our text comes from Matthew, and you've probably heard this before, but the Bible has four Gospels in it. Uh, I talk about the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and all those four Gospels tell us about the public ministry of Jesus Christ, but they tell us about Jesus' ministry from a different angle. And someone has aptly said that the Gospel of Matthew describes Jesus as the King, the King of the Jews. And the book of Mark describes Jesus as the humble servant. And the book of Luke describes Jesus as the perfect man. And the book of John describes Jesus as the Son of God. And so we're here in the book of Matthew, and again, Matthew described the Lord Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews, and everything in the book of Matthew is directed at convincing that Jew that Jesus is that promised king. Now, with your hand in Matthew 13, back up there to Matthew chapter 1, I'd like to 
convince you of that truth. Matthew 1 includes for us a genealogy. And a genealogy, it's talking about the son of and the son of, and this one begat this one and this one, and that's the family tree of Jesus Christ. And do you know, to a king, the genealogy would be very important. It's the genealogy of the king. When you get there to Matthew chapter 2, it talks about the details of Jesus' birth. It gives us the birth of the king. Look there in Matthew 2 and verse 2 saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? The birth of a king would be a big deal to the Jews. When you get to Matthew chapter 3, it talks about the baptism of Jesus and the anointing of Jesus. If you would, it's the anointing of a king. Matthew chapter number 4, we read about the 40-day temptation of Jesus Christ. It's the testing of a king. Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7 gives us the guidelines. When that king will finally sit on his throne, we might say that that's the constitution of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 9 record for us many of the miracles of Jesus. We might say it's the works or the credentials of the king. Matthew chapter number 10, when you get there, Jesus is sending out his 12 apostles. He tells them to go preach the gospel. And we would say that that was the heralds of the king. When you get to Matthew chapter number 11 and chapter 12, something tragic happens. The Pharisees and the religious rulers of Jesus' day refused Jesus Christ. They did not want Jesus Christ. We could say chapter 11 and chapter 12 uh, record the rejection of the king. And you know, from Matthew 13 onwards, something strange happens in the book of Matthew. That whole idea of Jesus sitting on a literal Jewish throne is kind of put on the back burner because they have just rejected him as king. And now Jesus begins to give truth, but kind of in a camouflage, mystery form, and he gives kingdom truth by means of parables. Someone has said, well, what exactly is a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and these parables found in Matthew 13 are very profound. Not only do they tell us about Jesus' coming kingdom, but they also give us insight into how our Lord works today. And I'd have us look here at Matthew 13, and again in verse number 44, the Bible says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. If I could tonight, I'd like to give you the number one cause for church splits all across our countries. Why there could be a blessed fellowship of God's people in a church, and then one day they split, and one part leaves and goes another way. You say, preacher, why does that happen? Verse 44 explains why it happens. I'd like to give you tonight the number one cause for divorces across our country. A man and a woman who at one time were happily married, one day decide that they're no longer happy together, they go separate ways. You say, Brother Carlson, why is it that divorces happen? Matthew 13 and verse 44 is the answer for that. I'd like to say to you tonight that this is the number one cause for friendships being broken amongst believers. People turning their backs on longtime friends. I'm talking about two Christians who now go out of their way to not speak to each other. Why does that happen? Verse number 44 explains why that happens. You say, what, 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 what? it's all there? Look at it again, again. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in the field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. If I could picture this, because I really want you to see the text before I preach it. 
We're getting that platform built. One day, the city slicker, he was walking down a country road, probably Sunday afternoon. You see, is that all in? It's all in the originals, if you could just get the originals. And he's walking down that country road. He's kicking rocks. He's watching birds, watching squirrels scamper across. And as he's walking down that country road that Sunday afternoon, he, he's just, and he looks off to the side. And in that field off to the side of that country road, Something is shiny. Something is sparkling. And it's got his attention. And so he looks down the road that way. There's no one. Looks down the road that way. There's no one. And he climbs ever so carefully over that barbed wire fence. And he gets himself into that field. And he pushes some of that brush and shrubbery aside. And he begins digging. And he finds a gold coin. And he, whoa! And he starts digging more. There's a second one. And there's a third and a fourth one. And the more he digs, the more gold he finds. And he realizes, this is not my field. And so he digs a hole, pushes all that gold back in, smooths the dirt over top, pulls the branches over top. He comes back over to that barbed wire fence. He climbs back over top. And he looks both ways and he says, this is not mine. And he thinks to himself, if I could just buy this field I'd be a rich man. And so he wonders, I wonder who owns it. And he looks that, and, and, he look, and he sees a farmyard just a short distance away, and he goes running down that road and comes to that farmyard door, and he knocks on that door, and a farmer comes out. All farmers have a piece of hay out of their, out of their mouth, and sure enough, he's got suspenders. Man comes to the door, and he said, how can I help you? And he said, you know what? I was just walking down the road today, and I noticed a piece of property, and I was wondering if I could buy it. Could you, would you, he said, man, so that is mine. But he said, listen, you're a city slicker. You wouldn't even know what to do with the land if you owned it. He said, please, would, could, could I just show you the piece of land that I want to buy? He said, okay. And so he walks out with them and he said, I want to buy everything from here. And he walks a little farther to here. He said, I'd like to buy one acre. Would you please sell me one acre of this land right here? And the farmer said, I can't sell that to you. It was given to me by my father. He gave, got it from his, I can't. And he said, please, please, just, just give me a price and I'll buy that land. And that farmer gets thinking and he looks at this city slicker with a big C on his forehead and thinks he, this guy's dumber than a box of rocks. And, and so he said, I'll tell you what. He said, $10,000. He said, if you come up with $10,000, you can buy that one acre. And the, the city slicker said, you draw up the deed. I will be back at your house tomorrow this exact same time. And the farmer walks away thinking, I've got myself a chump on the other end of this deal. And that city, slocker, uh, city, slocker, city slicker, he runs back home and he thinks to himself, all I need is $10,000. And sure enough, he, uh, he runs back home and uh, he uh, checks his bank account and he's got $4,000. He takes all $4,000 out of that bank account. He collects his golf clubs and his hunting rifle and his tennis racket and his fishing boat and his hockey equipment. And he runs down to Harry's Hardware. And he says, Harry, what would you pay me? And Harry said, I'd give you $1,000. He said, sold. He now has $5,000. He takes his uh, coin collection and his stamp collection, and he runs down, and, and there's a coin store down there. It's owned by Harry. And he said, Harry, what would you pay? And he said, five. I'll give you five. He said, I'll take it. He now has $5,500. He can't sell his house because it's rented. He takes his pickup truck down to the dealership. It's Harry's dealership. And uh, he sells that. He said, uh, he sells that for $3,500. It must have been a Chev. If it was a Ford, he wouldn't even have got that much. And so he, he uh, got $3,500. He now has $9,000, and he wonders, how am I going to get the rest? And he calls up his cousin Jed, and he said, Jed, he said, you've always, every time you come over, you've admired the furniture. What would you pay for every stick of furniture in my place? And Jed said, I can't. He said, what would you pay for every stick of furniture in my place? He said, well, I, I'd give you 800 He said, sold. I'll take 800 He's still $200 short. And then he, uh, he finally gathers together every stitch of clothing, all the dishes, all the food in the cupboards in the refrigerator, and he goes down to Harry and sells it to Harry for $200. He now has 10 
thousand dollars in his hand. He sold everything he has. And he comes that next day and he hands that $10,000 to that farmer. And the farmer has the deed uh, written up and the farmer signs it. He hands it. You say, Brother Carlson, that's in verse 44? It's all in there. It's all in there. Let's read the text to see if we've been accurate with the text. Matthew 13, verse 44 again. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now, I may have added one or two little details, <laughs> but all the rest of that is in that. To, how many are with me now? You understand where we're going? I'm going to preach tonight on this question. Are you seeing the treasure or the field? If you're taking notes, are you seeing the treasure or the field? Look there in verse 44 again. The kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field. Would you notice, first of all, the man didn't simply go and buy the treasure. He bought the field in which was a hidden treasure. If you're taking notes tonight, could I say, first of all, every treasure has its own field. Every treasure has its own field. Do you know when he went back to that field that he just purchased he found out to his dismay there were several thousand weeds in that field. He found there was thistles and nettles and dandelions. No matter what title you give them, there were weeds. There were spreading weeds and ugly weeds and food-stealing weeds. I'm sure there were several thousand rocks on that acre of property, big rocks and small rocks and dirty rocks and rocky rocks and boulder-sized rocks and pebble-sized rocks. These are all rocks that were going to have to be moved one at a time before he was going to be able to uh, do anything on that field. No doubt there was also plenty of dirt on that field. Some of that dirt was in clumps and some of that dirt was in ruts and some of that dirt was in big piles. And underneath that field, I'm sure there were gopher holes. And if you have gopher holes, there were gophers in the gopher holes. I imagine there were ant hills on that acre of field and several thousand ants crawling all over those ant hills. I imagine stretching, it wouldn't be stretching our imagination to think there were spiders there. And there were bugs there, and there were daddy long legs there, and there were mama short legs there. And I imagine there was mice there, and there was rats there, and maybe there was a skunk there, and a raccoon there. And I imagine uh, that wasn't all. Uh, could, could you just imagine as he wandered over that one acre of uh, field that he purchased, he found some garbage that was thrown on that field. Probably some McDonald cups, and Big Mac wrappers, and uh, Slurpee, 7-Eleven uh, uh, Slurpee cups, and probably Tim Horton cups, and they probably found an old worn out Ford truck tire there. And if there's a Ford truck tire, there's a Ford truck probably somewhere there. And uh, I'm sure there were dead trees lying on that ground. And the closer he looked, there was probably poison ivy somewhere there. And maybe there were some snakes and some lizards uh, who'd made their homes in that field. And, and uh, suppose that city slicker began to dig around and I'm sure he found other things. I'm sure he could have come face to face with a porcupine on that thing. Now, you say, well, preacher, what are you saying? I'm saying every treasure has its own field. You know, I was saying that we went shooting today, and, uh, and we all came back alive. It was just a wonderful thing. Uh, uh, I'm not a hunter. I'm not a hunter because my dad was never a hunter. And, and, you know, you normally inherit what your dad or mom had, and and, uh, but the men of the church came there a few years ago, and they said, Pastor Carlson, we want you to go hunting with us. Now, folks, listen, if you like hunting, I'm glad you like hunting. I just don't like hunting. I don't care about that. Give me a book to read. Give me something to study, a, a rifle book. Uh, give me something to study. And so I, I said, listen, I don't, even, I don't even have the hunter's safety. Oh, we'll get you through it. And they got me through it. And then I said, well, listen, I'd go hunting, but I don't have a gun. <laughs> one of our men walked up to me and he said, which one you want? He had two rifles there. Which one you want? And I said, what are you doing? He said, if you don't have your own, you won't go. Which, I'm going to give you one of these. I said, I, he said, I'm going to give you one of these. <laughs> which one do you want? Well, listen, pff, 
I, I, I grabbed that one. I said, I, grabbed, I said, this one. I want this one. He said, you don't even know what kind it is. I said, if I'm going to be hunting all day long, I'm going to take the lightest gun that I can have. I want this one. And for you that are gun lovers, it was a seven millimeter Mauser. Whoa. And anyway, that was a big deal to me. I put a scope on it. I thought if I'm going to get one shot, I might as well see what I'm shooting. And, uh, and so then they, they took me 10 days in a row. Not Sunday, but other than Sunday, 10 days in a row hunting. I saw four deer in 10 days. And I thought, this wasn't very productive. And we were pushing bush. You hunters would understand that. We were pushing bush. But I had one of our teenagers. He would not stay in line. He always had to be up ahead. And the, the best shot I had on the teenager, no, on the, on the deer, I knew our teenager was somewhere there. And I thought, no, that's all I need is to shoot one of our teens. I was so tired by the 10th day having only seen four deer. Uh, I was so tired by the middle of that 10th day, I just decided, I'm having a nap. Who cares? Who cares anymore? And so I looked all the way down the pathway that way. There, we were on a path, nothing down that way. Looked all the way down that way, and one of our teens was, I'm sure, a half a mile down there. And so I thought, I'm going to lay down right here. And I laid right on that path, and I took the uh, safety off the gun, so it was right. I thought, if any deer is stupid enough to come close, I'm going to get him. I fell asleep on that path. And you know how when you're, you're out cold and you wake up, and, and first thing I did was a jump up, and I looked to see how far that teen was. The teen is nowhere, nowhere. And I looked the other way, and the teen was now that far down that that he was there. I asked him, I said, Daryl, did you see me? He said, Preacher, see you. I stepped right over top of you. I thought you were dead. Uh, you know what? You say, why do you tell all that? Because when we were pushing bush, we were, I, I had my gun with the safety off. If anything came close, I was going to shoot it. And we were getting lower and lower and lower to get underneath this bush, and I came face to face with a porcupine. And I went lower and lower, and I backed my way. I think that maybe this farmer that bought this one acre, maybe he saw a porcupine. Maybe he saw a skunk, or maybe he smelled a skunk, but didn't know which way it was. Could I say to you, every treasure has its own field. Now stick with me. You say, Pastor, you told us that you were going to give the number one reason why it is that marriages break up and divorce. Do you remember, sir, when you first spotted her? I mean, listen, you could race cars down that main strip of your city. I mean, you could move mountains. You could bench press 450. But when you saw her for the first time, I, that someone said that every, every male goes through four stages in their life. And they say they start as a little baby boy in whining. And as they get older, it becomes wisecracks. And then as they get older, it goes to wheels. And then after that, it goes to a wife. If you stick around long enough, it returns to whining. And, uh, and a man goes through that process. And you know what? You could ably wrestle a wild bull or climb the highest mountain, but when you saw her, she made you melt. And you thought to yourself, who cares about racing anymore? Stick with me. I will trade everything for her. And you went to her dad, and you wanted to ask permission, and he said, you're not good enough for her. And you said, I know I'm not, but I'll prove myself. And over time, you proved yourself worthy, and he gave you permission, and then you had to sell everything you had to buy that ring, and you proposed, and you got married, and it was wonderful. Until a few months passed. And you started seeing some things in her that you never saw before. And she started seeing some things in you 
that she never saw before. Could I give you a little hint? Fields don't go on dates. Treasures go on dates. They never take their field. Pastor, why is it that marriages end up in divorce? Because you lost the sight of the fact that every treasure has its own field. Remember the first time you walked into an independent, Bible-believing, Baptist church? Maybe you'd attended churches before, got a little disillusioned about churches before. You got to see all the religiosity that's happening in many churches. And for whatever reason, you drove down that road and you noticed the church sign. And you decided, honey, let's, let's go to that church. Let's just check it out. We, I know what we've heard, but let's go see it for the first time. And you couldn't even get to a chair without three men and two women coming up and shaking your hand. And you weren't used to that. You found a friendliness for the first time that you'd never seen before. And then you listened as the piano or the organ was played, and it was old-fashioned hymns. And it had been a long time since you'd been in a church where there was old-fashioned hymns. The song director gets up there and has you turn to a particular page, and people are actually singing out of their mouth. You're used to people singing out of their ears because you never see them moving, uh, their mouth moving. And, and people enjoy these songs. And you then hear the preaching and they ask you to open up a Bible and they read it. And you don't have to close it and put it away. You have to keep it open because they want you to turn to that verse and turn to that verse. And you elbowed your husband or you elbowed your wife and said, boy, we've been looking for a church like this for a long time. And as you heard the preaching, and then something was happening in your heart during that preaching, you said, honey, this is, this is called conviction. Isn't this what we've been looking? And then at the end of the preaching, boy, someone went up to play that piano, and that preacher had the audacity to ask if God has spoken to your heart. Why don't you right now respond to that preaching? And you watched because you opened your eyes. And you watched people go up to an old-fashioned altar. And you'd read about altar calls in books before, but you'd never been in a church that had an invitation and an altar call. And you said to your husband, you said to your wife, this is the kind of church we've been praying for. And you walked out of that door and three or four other people shook hands and you were given a visitor's card and they said, when can you come back? And the preacher said, I'd like to stop by at your house and pay you a visit. Maybe you've got some questions. Oh, do we have questions? We sure do. And you started telling your family, we found one of them old-fashioned churches. And they said, wow. And then you told them where it was, Berean Bible Baptist Church. And then they said, not that church. You don't want to go to that church. Do you, remember, do you remember when you first started coming to a Bible preaching church? Well, then you joined it. And then a couple months later, oh, I didn't know that. Well, I never saw that before. Well, I didn't know that so and so, every treasure has its own field. I give you a second truth that we learn in the text. Not only every treasure has its own field, but look there again in Matthew 13 and verse number 44. Matthew 13 and verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth. Do uh, you know, secondly, uh, you must choose to overlook the field for the treasure. You must choose to overlook the field for the treasure. No, I've painted this city slicker as completely stupid. But I have to admit, I don't think he was completely stupid. I don't think that he was so dumb that he thought all one acre was solid gold. Are you with me? He knew that there were going to be other things, but he made a conscious choice to overlook those things and focus on the treasure. Do you know why some marriages represented tonight here are good, strong, healthy 
marriages, while there are other marriages here that you're just kind of being held together by threads, <laughs> you tolerate each other, because the good marriages recognize, yes, there's field, but I am choosing to focus on the treasure of my wife, of my husband. It's a choice. While the other has chosen to focus on the field. Folks, it's a choice. It's a choice. And if your marriage is strong, it's because you've chosen to focus on the treasure. If you are still as in love with your church as you were those early days when you walked in, it's not because you're not aware that there's some problems, that you're not aware that there are some issues. You have chosen to focus on the treasure of your church instead of focus on the field. It's a choice. It's a choice. I say to you, secondly, if you've not already written down, you must choose to overlook the field for the treasure. Do you know there's not one of us that when we got married <laughs> thought that that woman, that man that we were marrying was perfect. Now, when I say that, there's always some, oh, I thought he was perfect. Okay, except for you. <laughs> we all knew that there would be issues. But isn't it true on that wedding day? We focused on the treasure. Do you know in the ministry, I have some great preacher friends. Not a one of them are here. I'm kidding. I've got some great <laughs> preacher friends. I, uh, I thought about Brother Stevens. You know, I call Brother Stevens. I'm sure it's always at an in inopportune time. I'll be studying away at something, and it's about two hours before I'm going to be teaching and or preaching it, and I'm frustrated. I, I don't have the answer for it. And he made the, he made the life-changing mistake of giving, giving me his cell phone number years ago. And so I'll just skip right past the home number and go right to his cell number. And I'm sure he's driving or bench pressing 450 pounds. And, and I'll say, Brother Stevens, just go out a minute. Get you a good minute. Back. Good minute, brother. What? And, and you know what? I've got some great preacher friends. Do you know that all of them have fields? All of them. You know why they're still my friends? I've chosen to focus on the treasure instead of the field. I, uh, in 1979 and 1980, and this name probably wouldn't mean anything to you, but it was at a time in my life where I knew that if I didn't back up and get under someone else's teaching, that I was going to be a casualty in Christianity. I knew that. Long story, and you don't need to hear the story. But I, uh, I knew uh, on the radio uh, in Canada, there was an old-timer, Perry F. Rockwood. And he was out in eastern Canada, and I, I, I took a trip out there, and he had a radio ministry all around the world, 300 radio stations. And, and uh, I, uh, I said to him, I said, Brother Rockwood, I'd like to come out and work in your ministry. And I was there in 1979, 1980. You say, Brother Carlson, what do you think of that man? Great man. Great man. Great man of God. Uh, uh, he'd get up at five in the morning to record his radio broadcast. He, was, well, he still was in the old manual typewriter <laughs> stage. And I remember walking into the office there, 745, and I could hear him up in his office. What was, he was typing out another message that he'd preach. And, you know, that man had such a zeal to see souls won for Christ. And I would see him walking up and down the streets, 65 years of age, handing out gospel tracts, wanting to lead people to Christ. You say, he probably didn't have a field. He sure did. But I chose to focus on his treasure. I went to, uh, I went to Bible college in North Carolina. Carl Lackey was the pastor. Just a tough, rough mean, hateful, older man. <laughs> and I'll tell you, you know what? You either loved him or you hated him. I remember we all had a Sunday school bus route. I remember knocking on a door one time trying to get some new visitors. 
and a man came to the door and I said, my name's Rob Carlson, we're out visiting from White Plains Baptist Church, and I didn't even get anything else out. He said, lackey. <laughs> and I said, yes, Pastor Lackey. He says, lackey. Well, I could just tell by his countenance that, you know, <laughs> Brother Lackey probably wasn't his favorite preacher. And he said, son, he said, I'll just tell you why I hate lackey so much. Well, I, I didn't ask to hear it, but I was about to hear it. He said, I'm an ambulance driver, and I have personally driven two women to the hospital that Lackey gave heart attacks to. And I said, oh. So after bus visiting that day, I went back to the church. Brother Lackey was in the office, and I said, I've learned about you today. And he said, son, what'd you learn? And I said, I talked to an ambulance driver, and he said that he personally drove two women to the hospital that you and your preaching gave a heart attack to. He said, ah. Oh. He said, I've given heart attacks to more than two women. And... Uh, <laughs> He was hateful. He was mean. I remember one time he had one of these big greyhound buses the church owned, and he'd be asked to preach somewhere, and he was asked to preach down in Florida. And I remember he said to me, he said, son, you coming with us? I said, where? He said, to Florida. I said, no. <coughs> and I always went, no. He said, why aren't you going? I said, preacher, last conference I went, you had me taking care of all the little babies and the little children. If I wanted to run a babysitting ministry, I'd do it here. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, if you come with me to Florida, I'll make sure you're not taking care of the little babies. I said, deal. And so went with him down there to Florida, and after that Monday night service, he said, hop in the car. He had a, he had a Cadillac. He said, hop with the car. He said, you're driving me to the motel. I said, okay. He said, bring your stuff. I said, okay. And so I uh, got to the motel there, and, and uh, it, now, on the way there, he said, one, he said, you're preaching in the I said, I'm preaching, I'm not, I was, I was like a 19-year-old kid. I said, I'm not preaching, and he said, you're preaching in the morning. I, he said, secondly, he said, you're staying with me in the motel all night. Now, I thought, good grief, we're going to pray all night long. <laughs> now... I'm not going to get any sleep tonight. I'm going to be praying all night long. And he walked into that motel room, and he walked right into the bathroom. There was two double beds there, so I'm just standing there with my suitcase, and I'm letting him pick. I mean, he is the senior here. I'm going to let him pick which bed he wants, and I get the other one. He walked into that bathroom. He came out two minutes later. He pulled the sheets aside. He climbed in suit, tie, shoes and all. He got into that bed, he pulled the blankets up to here, and he lifted up his head to me and he said, good night. <laughs> and he was gone. Well, I, uh, since he said I was preaching, I thought I better get a message together. And so I sat down at the desk, I went and got a towel, pulled it over the lamp there so I wouldn't wake him up. And at about quarter to three in the morning, he, uh, he lifted up his head. He said, son, aren't you going to sleep tonight? I said, well, if I'm preaching in the morning, I better have something. He said, you're always supposed to have a message ready. What's wrong with you? I said, well, I don't think I have the right one, so I have to work on another one. And he fell asleep. Within a minute, he was back to sleep again. I said, how do you know? I could hear him snoring. And so I got to bed about 3.30. Well, you know when you sleep and you wake up and you think someone's staring at you? I woke up that next morning and I looked at the clock and it was 7.30 and I thought, Oh, yeah, sure. He's been praying for the last four hours now. And, and I slowly turned over and looked at his bed. He's still sleeping. And, and I went into the bathroom to do what people are supposed to do in the bathroom. And, and he knocked on that bathroom door a few minutes later. And he said, son, we're leaving in two minutes. He said, preacher, why are you saying all that? Did he even pray that night? <laughs> Every treasure has its own field. Uh, my wife's home pastor was Pastor Don Green. You know, uh, Brother Green, we had preached at our church four years in a row, four revivals in a row. He prays four hours every morning. I'm serious. Four hours. I could tell you about his field. I'd rather tell you about his treasure. Say, how do you know he prays? I went in the room underneath his room. I wanted to hear it. I wanted to hear how a man prays for four hours. And he prayed for me in those four hours. 
prayed for my family in those four hours. Every friend you have has a treasure and has a field. And as long as you keep focused on their treasure, you'll value their friendship. Every church, you say, oh, yeah, do, Brother Carlson, you just haven't been here long enough to find out. Every church has problems. Well, we're just going to leave this church and go down to Brother Stevens. Don't do that. He's got more problems. <laughs> We have people that leave our church and said, I'm never coming back here ever again. Why? Well, we just found out, oh, man, it's going on for a long time. <laughs> but where are you going to go that doesn't also have feel? Are you with me? I say to you, every treasure has its own field. Secondly, you must choose to overlook the field for the treasure. Could I give you a third thing? Matthew 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Would you understand that when this man went and bought that field, he didn't just take pocket change to go buy that field. That verse number 44 has a very important word in it. And for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. He sold everything to get that field. That means all of his future, all of his family's future, all of his children's future depended on what he now did with that land. And had that man decided that he was going to walk away from that field, he and his family would suffer for that decision for a long time. They say, I, I, can walk, I can walk away from my family. You'll suffer for that decision for a long time. Oh, I can walk away from church. I don't need church. You will suffer for that decision for a long time. But not just you. Your family. Uh, turn, hold your hand in Matthew 13. Turn to Psalm 109. Let me show you a case of a man that walked away because all he could see was field. And he lost sight of the treasure. Psalm chapter 109. Psalm chapter 109. Look there in verse number 8. Psalm 109, verse number 8. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Now, I need you to talk to me out loud. That verse was quoted again in the New Testament. Who remembers where it's quoted in the New Testament? Anyone remember? Anyone remember? In Acts chapter number 1, Peter stood up and said, Judas has hung himself we have to pick a replacement. So Acts 1 gives us the heads up that Psalm 109 is talking about Judas. Do you know that Judas came to, there was in, in the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Judas traded everything away to follow Jesus Christ. And somewhere in that ministry, Judas got his eyes off of the treasure of Jesus Christ and thought he saw a field. There's only one person that's ever lived on this earth that had no field. Jesus Christ. 
But you know what happens when you shift your attention? All that you see is fault. Are you with me? Listen, we can't afford, whether it's in a marriage, whether it's in a friendship, whether it's in a church situation, we can't afford to shift our attention to what we think are the faults because we will stop seeing any good. And what a heartbreak when two years ago came to an altar and said, I do, I do, or I will, I will. And they joined in holy matrimony. What a horrible day when all that they can see is fault and field in each other. So Psalm 109 is talking about Judas. Let's see what else Psalm 109 tells us. We read verse 8. Let his, Judas's days be few, and let another take his office, the office of an apostle. Verse 9. Let his, Judas's children, be fatherless, and his, Judas's wife, a widow. Let his, Judas's children, be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them, Judas's children, seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his, Judas's posterity, be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Do you understand when he shifted from seeing the treasure in Jesus Christ to the field? He hurt for a long time. Can you just imagine little Sally Iscariot, his daughter, coming home from school, just a bawling. Mama, why won't any of the little girls play with me? And that Mrs. Iscariot putting her arm around little Sally trying to give her words of comfort, and there's no words to give to a little girl like that. In comes little Bobby Iscariot with yet even another black eye. Bobby, <laughs> what happened? And he's kind of whimpering, Mama, why do the boys keep picking on me? Mama, I don't start it. Mama, you told me to run from a fight. I am not picking fights, Mama. Why do those boys keep picking on me? He said, Brother Carlson, I think you're making that up. Well, look again at Psalm 109, verse 12. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Are we fair with the text? Sir, you take your eyes off of the treasure and focus on the field. And you're making a huge, bad decision. I've seen it happen in our church, in our church where once a couple would come in that back door, a married couple, and they'd be so excited. They'd race to get a front seat. You couldn't out-sing as they sang the hymns with the rest of the congregation. And when it came to invitation time, man, they were there. They were there. And then I've watched it happen. And we that are pastors have seen it happen more than once. It's no longer the front. Now it slowly makes its way back. And I'm not making fun of people that sit in the back. We have, we have rows designated for parents with little children. I understand all that. You understand what I'm saying. I have watched couples make their way slowly who used to sit near the front make their way to the back. And then the way our church is designed, we have a big lobby with glass windows there and if you have some child that's really energetic, we have them out in the lobby. I've seen them move themselves to now they're sitting full-time and they don't have children. 
Why are they sitting back there? You know what? There's only one more step after the lobby. Out. You say you're being critical. No. They took their eyes off the treasure, and now they're focusing on the field. And now there's nothing I can say that's right. There's nothing. And we that are pastors know that. There are some people that come with pen and paper in hand to take the outline. There are other people that come with pen and paper in hand to write down the faults. If you're there, if that's where you're at, and all that you walk out of a service is remembering that one statement, that one harsh thing, you have now lost sight of the treasure and all you can see is the field. And it's going to have a profound effect the rest of your life. Sally Iscariot didn't deserve that. Bobby Iscariot didn't deserve that. Your children don't have a fighting chance in this world. Dad, if you get your eyes off the treasure and all you see is the field. Judas Iscariot made the mistake of taking his eyes off the treasure. Isn't that exactly what Lot did? Lot grew up with Uncle Abraham. Lot reaped all the benefits by sticking close to Uncle Abraham. And one day, Genesis 13, Lot took his eyes off the treasure of his uncle and began to look around, and ultimately he moved into Sodom. Genesis 19 tells us he lost his wife. He lost his children. He lost his job. He lost his joy. He lost his testimony. And his children, who had a chance to amount to something for God, missed that chance. Why? Because Daddy made a bad decision. You'll not walk away from your wife without it bearing big consequences. You'll not walk away from your husband, from your children, from your church. And when you slip from treasure hunter to field inspector, it'll sour everything you've got. Many years ago, after the Civil War, Robert E. Lee visited a Kentucky lady who took him to the remains of a grand old tree in the front of her house. And she bitterly cried because that tree's limbs and trunk had all been shot up and beat up by federal artillery fire. And she looked to Robert E. Lee for some word condemning the North or at least sympathizing with her for her great loss. And Robert E. Lee looked at the tree and he looked at the woman and he looked at the tree and then he looked at the woman and he said, ma'am, cut it down. And she looked with such shock. He said, cut it down and forget the tree. It's better to forgive the injustices of the past than allow them to remain lest bitterness take root and poison the rest of your life. There are probably somebody in this congregation tonight, someone said something to you in the past and you have never gotten over it. Maybe it was a husband. Maybe it was your wife. Maybe it was the preacher. Could I give you a little hint? You can't stand behind a pulpit for an hour at a time, three times a week, 52, time, 52 weeks a year, without saying something that's going to offend somebody. 
I challenge you to speak three hours a week in front of a hundred people 52 weeks a year without something either coming out wrong <laughs> or harsh. <laughs> What's your problem? Seven odd years ago. Seven? I had a lady come to me one time and she said, Pastor Carlson, years ago, you said something that was so harsh. I said, years ago? That's the last time you got something on me? It was years ago? You say, you're so unsympathetic. No. Could I say to you in the words of Robert E. Lee, cut it down. If you don't bury that thing at the foot of the cross, it will destroy you. Your marriage strained. You say, preacher, she doesn't look like she did that day we got married. Could I give you a surprising announcement? <laughs> you don't either. And as she has put up with you this long, <laughs> you have been blessed more than you deserve. Pastor, you probably don't know some of the things that have happened over the last years in this church. Granted. But the fact that God still lets you come to this church and still speaks to your heart, you have been blessed more than you deserve. I'm honored to be a pastor. So haven't anyone ever said anything? Oh, yes. You know, I used to say this to my wife. We had two men in our church that were in cahoots. I called one of them Pilate and the other Herod. <laughs> Not to their face. <laughs> and, and, and really, when those two men got me in a room and a shut door, it was just, it was bad. You say, what'd you do? I just took it. So you should have, well, no, whatever. When you're a pastor, you can do what you want. I just took it. And the next time they'd walk into the church, I'd put my hand out and I'd say, thanks for coming. You say, I wouldn't do that. Well, when you're a pastor, you can do what you want. I refuse to let the past destroy my ability to love them and to help them. Because the day that I hate people for what they may have said, I can no longer help them. One of them had a heart attack. And when I heard it, I got my vehicle and I went to the hospital and I walked into that room and he, laying in that bed, opened his eyes, and he saw me there, and tears welled up in his eyes. And they began to run down his cheeks, and he said, How could you come to visit me with everything that I have said and done against you? And I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, Brother, that's all in the past. Now, is yours in the past? Have you been able to put it behind you? Aren't you glad that God puts our sins in the past? Let's pray. Father, the title is very clear. Are you seeing the treasure or the field? Lord, there might be some folks that are struggling because they've taken their eyes off the treasure of their wife, their husband, their children, their parents, their family, their church family. 
Lord, if we can't get our eyes back on the treasure, it won't be long before all that we have will be traded away in bitterness. Lord, maybe tonight we need to thank God that He can look past all of our field and see treasure. Paul said we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And that treasure is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Lord, maybe tonight someone needs to thank God that he still sees treasure in we who are saved. But Lord, maybe we need to ask God to help us to once again focus on the treasure of those in our life. Focus on the treasure of our church for our sake, for the sake of our children, for the sake of the generations to come. Help us, Lord. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, with no one looking around tonight, how many could say, Pastor Carlson, if I were to die today, I'm absolutely sure I'd go to heaven. Not maybe, not hope so. Preacher, I have trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you slip your hand up if you've done that? Preacher, I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. You can take your hands down. Is there one tonight with heads still bowed and eyes closed, Pastor Carlson? I couldn't raise my hand there. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I've never trusted Jesus as my Savior. I need to get saved. Here's my uplifted hand. Would you pray for me? Is there one like that tonight? I see that hand. Is there another? I am not saved. I need to get saved. Please pray for me. And then tonight, to the point of the message, either you are a treasure seeker, a treasure admirer, a treasure appreciator, or you have shifted into a field inspector, and all that you see is field. Is there one tonight, Pastor, somewhere in this? As you preached, God spoke to my heart. I want God to help me. Please pray for me. God bless you. God bless you. Father, one hand was raised. Not sure that they're saved. Not sure that they're on their way to heaven. How we'd love to take a Bible and show them the verses. Show them what it means to be saved. Lord, I pray that they would come. But Lord, for others who you spoke to hearts. Lord, it's so easy to lose sight of the treasure and begin to inspect the field. Help us to get our eyes on the treasure. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.